In this week's carrier wrap, we speak with Verizon to look at its recent IoT moves and how the operator views the ongoing development of the IoT market. All right, well, thanks for joining us in this week's Carrier Wrap. I'm your host, Dan Meyer, Editor-in-Chief here at RCR Wireless News. And uh, this week, we are joined by Mark Bordemaleo, who's the uh, VP of Connected Solutions and IoT at Verizon, to talk a bit about uh, the company's work in the IoT space. So, hey, Mark, thanks for joining us. And I, I, I apologize again for, bar- for butchering your last name there. But, uh, but again, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. I know. It's great, Dan. Thanks for letting me join you and the team today. It's, it's great. So uh, just give you a little bit of background sure. about what Verizon's been doing. Um, I've been involved at Verizon in the machine-to-machine business for really over the past 12 years. And we've seen that business grow pretty significantly, you know, putting on, you know, more than 20 million devices you know, onto the network over those years. And as you know, and your viewers know, these tend to be meters and pumps and different types of equipment that might be on a smart grid you know, type of deployment. And as we look at the transition to IoT, the big question we've asked is, how do we really make this grow? And we've all seen uh, the hype around IoT and machine to machine that we're going to have 20 billion devices you know, on the network by you know, 2020. So I'm figuring that between us and the other major carriers, we only need to put on another 19 billion, <laughs> 890 million in the next four years. And it all worked out really well. Um, but you know, the fact is, when we go in and we look at our base of customers, you know, we do see very low participation rates. And those participation rates are low because when people look at IoT, what they see is complexity, they see business spaces that aren't necessarily well defined, they see a very fragmented ecosystem, and then they also see a lack of standards. And so if you're going to deploy, you really have in the past needed a world-class CTO organization to sort of manage the risk, manage the ecosystem, and really put forth the capital in this type of environment. So the reason Verizon has decided to participate in this market in a very big way is to bring scale to drive standards, very similar to what you're seeing us do with 5G right now. Yep. Uh, bring all of our assets together, connectivity, platform, and applications. And we believe by bringing them together, we can simplify IoT and not only connect more devices onto the network, but also grow our revenues up that revenue stack overall by simplifying IoT. Makes sense. Makes sense. Well, again, I mean, you bring up a lot of the challenges that are in the market today, and I guess those would seem to be to some people uh, pretty significant challenges, obviously. Uh, but you guys are, like you say, kind of doing quite a bit of work there. I mean, I guess as a as a company looks or as an industry looks at the space, um, I mean, are those challenges? Um, I guess are they um, are surmountable today, or are those things that are kind of like an ongoing process where you know some things will pop up? Obviously, standards is a big issue all the time. Business cases are always a big issue. I guess how should they uh, approach? looking at uh, getting into this, this IoT space today? Yeah, so I think number one is making sure we have a well-defined business case. Okay. And uh, believe it or not, the regulatory environment has really helped a lot of businesses participate you know, in IoT and machine to machine. So you look back at the Energy Act, and when that regulation went into effect, you know, it really started defining the standards for the national grid. So you did see organizations like Duke and SoCal Edison and Con Ed and Constellation really drive at those standards you know, with the regulatory uh, departments mm-hmm. and start to play. Um, you know, uh, electronic meter monitoring, a lot of SCADA, substation monitoring, and they grew it and they grew it. And these were the early adopters. You know, we saw the same thing uh, with the Railroad Safety Act of 2005 with the adoption of positive train control, which is still being deployed today. But what it did is it really brought together the, the big five class one freight carriers to work on how do we define interoperability? How do we really make the uh, railway safer? And at the same time, how do we improve our efficiency and the safety of not only our passengers and cargo, but the employees? So that's really helped. And now we're seeing the same thing in the Food Safety Act, we're seeing it in the Drug Safety Act, where people are adopting standards for things like traffic traits 
and supply chain management on a global scale. So I think it's about prioritization. You know, what's really important and how do the industries come together to really address interoperability and so Gotcha, gotcha. And I guess, is there a pretty good cooperation across the telecom space in terms of uh, interoperability? Because it does seem like that you know, most of the major operators are getting pretty involved in this IoT space. Uh, and, and a lot of them are doing, you know, maybe some stuff, maybe some proprietary stuff in, in some instances. Um, and I, it seems like you, you always want to have kind of some sort of a set standard, if you can, to make it easier for industries to get involved. I, I guess, are you seeing good cooperation across the telecom side of things in terms of moving this uh, the space forward? In certain areas, so you know, when we look at things like GSMA or the three GPP standards, uh, narrow banding IoT, I think is an example where the large carriers on a global basis came together to really work on the standards. I think another example is 5G, where um, you know we looked at that and said we want to accelerate 5G. You know, we don't think 5G is something that's going to be you know, 2019 or 2021, which were the dates that were being discussed at the time. So, you know, our CTO stepped up and said, hey, look, we're going to go ahead, we're going to deploy 5G in 10 markets this year, you know, which we have on a very limited basis, and we're going to bring together the ecosystem. So you saw Ericsson and Nokia and Apple and Samsung and everyone really come together. And then as we learn more about how 5G could perform and some of the hurdles, we shared all that information with everyone in the industry. And so what that did is it wasn't Verizon or any one company driving the standard, mm -hmm. it was really making all the information available for open debate and consideration. We think that accelerates adoption, but, but that's something I, I think where there is good cooperation around technology standards. Makes sense. And I guess in terms of standards, I mean, I guess we're hearing a lot lately of, you know, the various category of devices, category M, category one, uh, narrowband IoT. Uh, it does seem like there are all these various, and they all have a, seem like a slice of the pie there. Um, is there, I guess, is there a goal to kind of simplify that? Or are we going to see kind of IoT really be this pretty expansive uh, uh, sliced up uh, situation where, you know, there, there are different devices for different uh, types of applications and different network connections? Yeah, so I guess about a year ago, we were working on Cat1. Yeah. And we were saying, well, Cat M is still pretty far out, and you know, we're going to work on Cat M. But you know, what we saw in the marketplace is the market was saying, well, why would I want to deploy Cat1 when Cat M is coming? And Cat M is going to be more power efficient, um, and it's really going to serve my need, and it's probably at a lower cost than Cat1. Now, all of a sudden, what we're doing is we're seeing modules that are cat m -ray. And so they've combined them into a single SKU. So that's really going to accelerate the adoption. And then ultimately, you know, we'll see the narrowband and IoT you know, be deployed. We think the important part about the narrowband and IoT is taking advantage of the existing wireless infrastructure that's out there today. And that further will accelerate adoption of narrowband and IoT. However, the market wants to approach it, you know, in terms of license spectrum, you know, existing infrastructure, service level agreements versus best effort. We think the market looks at all of this, you know, particularly uh, when we start thinking about safety issues or smart cities, you know, as we see more critical infrastructure moving to sort of a digital environment, I think resiliency is top of mind. And so, you know, where we see, you know, potentially in the future, whether it's a, you know, very bad storm, like we had in New York, you know, a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. what the municipalities are thinking about is how quickly can you get this back up and operational, you know, uh, what's the fallback, you know, technology in the event of bad storm. So those are all things that people are actually, as users, considering, but it's not potentially debated, you know, in public when we start talking about standards and license versus unlicensed spectrum. Yeah, and that's interesting because you're right, because there are so many um, issues involved behind the scenes in terms of what IoT is going to do, but there are like regulatory issues and public safety issues involved and, and so many things involved. I mean, it's, it's, you know, we see almost like just the tip of the iceberg and it's really under the water. There's so many things happening involved in this. And obviously it seems like you guys, uh, it's important to have the vendors in place, I'm guessing, to make all this work. I know you guys have been pretty aggressive recently uh, in partnerships with uh, various companies out there. I know there was the uh, uh, Cincinnati acquisition recently as well, too. I guess can you talk a bit about the importance of, of what, 
Verizon is kind of doing internally, but also with partnerships involved, it involved the partnerships and kind of bringing this all together for, for kind of a, a more holistic uh, and, 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 you know, approach to, to the market. Yeah, so it's all part of that, you know, reducing the fragmentation yeah. and, you know, trying to, you know, help our customers uh, participate more in IoT by bringing together that ecosystem. So when we see companies out there like Sense, uh, that really makes sense to be, you know, on our network as part of a solution. And we think smart cities, you know, is something that does make a lot of sense for carriers. Uh, in, in the example of Verizon, you know, we've invested, you know, billions and billions, hundreds of billions of dollars in underground infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the largest municipalities in the United States, where over the past, you know, 120 years, we've connected every stock exchange, computer, business, office, and it's long, long term. We think about 120 years. Sure. You know, what was going on in Manhattan over 100 years ago when someone was saying, look, we're going to connect all of these apartment buildings and all of these dwellings and people are like, oh, that'll never happen. But it's that slow, steady, reliability, business case, evolution. And so what we really see now is, you know, the public safety environments, um, you know, the intersection management, the sustainability initiatives, the parking management, those are really all adjacent opportunities, which we think will play out over very long periods as well. Some will be adopted much faster, but at the end of the day, when you look at municipalities like New York and Boston, or even you know, some of the international cities, they've been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, and their planning horizon is sort of in that same vein. You know, they're, they're making decisions over decades about where to invest. Yeah, it makes sense. So whenever people talk about IoT being a being a new thing to the market, we could just say no, no. It's been around for a hundred years or so, really. It's just a, a different name today. It used to be machine to machine. It used to be something else. Now it's just IoT, really. Well, so, um, you know, I think the big thing about IoT is connecting more devices, yeah. and then you know the adoption of new technologies. You know, like you, you mentioned, you know, CAD M1 and narrow band IoT. It just allows us to connect more devices at a lower cost, where previously it was cost prohibitive, you know, because the technology that was in the marketplace, it didn't make sense to connect a lot of these devices at the cost. Yeah. And so now, you know, with narrow banding IoT, what we're really going to be able to do is, you know, connect devices that are going to use very little data over a very long period of time, which is really different, you know, so in the, over the past 10 years, we've really been thinking about terms of connecting devices that would use a lot of data, and now it's about connecting a lot of devices that use very, very little data. Yeah, but, but that also brings, I guess, into the case of uh, really different business models, even for yourselves. I mean, obviously, historically, you know, on the, on the wireless side of things, you know, it was very high ARPU type of, uh, of service offering. Now, when it comes to IoT and even the older machine and machine stuff, it is kind of almost a very different uh, business model. Margins are maybe a little thinner. Uh, you obviously have to kind of go in at a lower price point for a lot of these things. I guess, how do you guys approach uh, tackling that aspect of it? Because it seems like, you know, end of the day, you know, it is a, a money-making venture, obviously. So you want to make sure that the business case makes sense for you guys. I guess, how, how much of a challenge is that for you to kind of make sure that all that kind of still makes sense? Yeah. So, you know, there's three things happening at the same time. And, and one, as you're pointing to right now, is that the cost per megabyte or the cost per kilobyte continues to go down. And actually, you know, going down pretty rapidly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but at the same time, the data consumption rates are just, you know, skyrocketing. And this is all happening for the most part across fixed infrastructure. Although, you know, it, you know it's not free and you know, we are pumping more and more technology into the ground. And so where the, the advantage really starts to work uh, for everyone, the user community and the carriers, is that every time we make a technology shift, the cost to deliver the service should be reduced, and in fact, it is reduced. So, if you look at the cost to deliver a megabyte of data, you know, in 2G versus 3G, big, big uh, cost efficiencies. 3G to 4G, big cost efficiencies, uh, you know, both in the equipment and the network. And now, you know, you're looking at things like software defined networks, you know, virtual networks. You're looking at the efficiencies with a lot of the cloud infrastructure and secure connection capabilities. And, you know, the move to 5G, again, is going to be significantly reduce the cost of deliver a megabyte. And the and consumption just keeps, you know, going higher and higher. Um, and then with IoT, you know, what you're really seeing is uh, devices that aren't really consuming much data at all 
uh, and I think in fact a lot of the devices people are talking about deploying may not use any data unless there's an exception that occurs. Yeah, yeah. Something is moved or uh, temperature is exceeded. Yeah, but there's huge business value there, and yeah, then it just needs to be balanced. Yeah, that's interesting to look at. And you're right, too, it does seem like uh, that this evolution of kind of various technologies have really allowed IoT to kind of uh, gain more traction and make more sense because, you know, I always kind of ask people, you know, is IoT, is, is, it, is it there because people are asking for it or is it there because people are asking for it, but also because there's technology to support it nowadays? Because it does seem like, like you were saying, the software side of things have really allowed networks and operators to kind of control, have greater control of their network to allow IoT to actually make financial sense more today than maybe it did 10 years ago too. Yeah, yeah. so I don't think that you know, we see customers who are coming out and saying, you know, I need IoT yeah, or, sure. or, or you know, some specific technology. But what I are saying is that you know, I think there's a better way for me to serve our customers. So what I'd like to be able to do is you know, monitor the generator at Dan's house and give him reports on that. Or I'd like to be able to monitor a lot of the appliances in your home um, it's the same way you saw the evolution of telematics. So, you know, how do we really create a business model yeah. that delivers a better customer experience for you? So, it, we tend to look at a lot of these as sort of a B to B to C, you know, model. And it's the same thing within smart cities. So, you know, working with the municipalities, what they're saying is, you know, how can I reduce congestion? You know, how can we drive a more, you know, sustainable uh, more livable uh, environment within the city, but at the same time promote economic growth. I mean, you, know, you can make a city more sustainable and reduce smog, just eliminate the cars, but it's going to have a huge impact on your economic growth. And so they're trying to balance all these things, and that's where you say, well, if I could connect seemingly dissimilar, you know, types of technologies within the municipality and make them work together, I could probably get some advantage. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, just get rid of the cars and it all is so much easier after that. But yeah, look at that. But uh, anyway, uh, well, I guess maybe, maybe a final topic is I guess the importance of network to all this because obviously Verizon's kind of in a unique space because you guys have a pretty robust wire line, but also the wireless network as well. Uh, I guess how important is that to be? Because I think people uh, maybe, because we cover mostly on the mobile side of things, we maybe get conf or kind of you know, focused on the fact that IoT is really mobile focused. But really, a lot of these devices, these you know, 50 billion, 20 billion devices, are going to have a wired connection too. So I guess, I guess how important is it to have, uh, you know, I guess, both capabilities and then maybe even touch a bit on uh, the importance of 5G to this because it does seem like at least now, you know, IoT is rolling out on LTE-based services, 4G-based services, even there's 3G and 2G as well. But I guess how important is 5G going to be to this going forward uh, for, for Verizon too? Yeah, so that's a good point. Everything has to work together. Yeah. And I think the example I'll talk through a little bit here is as we've always looked at spectrum and spectrum efficiency and the ability to you know, consume more data on a wireless network, what you have to remember is that you know, that's basically you know, traversing you know, a landline network. At some point, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So several years ago, we really started consuming fiber. And you know, we went out and you know, we put in more fiber to all the towers. Yeah, we went into a lot of our core markets yeah. with really, really big copper replacement plans, yeah, more and more fiber, and we're continuing to do that with investments in fiber. So, so you saw that with you know, some of the acquisitions we made in the yeah. XM communications you know, back several months ago, you know, that announcement. And so this is all about ensuring that you know, we are able to move data very efficiently and that there is not choke points within the network. And then, you know, out on the wireless, you know, side of that, you know, particularly with 5G, you know, what you're seeing is cell densification. Yeah. So as we believe you're going to consume more and more data on the 5G network, we know we're going to have to, you know, basically have a lot more spectrum efficiency. We're doing the cell densification. You know, we think that uh, it's going to start in the very, very poor urban markets. So we have to solve for these sort of urban canyons that exist, you know, by putting up other cell sites. And we see this really in the front end tying together very nicely with the spark solutions because that, that cell densification will happen first, you know, within these big municipalities. And of course, we want to take advantage of the investment in those markets to connect more devices onto that 5G network and then also deliver services to consumers in the home.
Yeah, that makes sense. And again, it does seem like you're right. With, uh, with IoT, it really is kind of forcing these 5G deployments to be uh, as efficient as possible. And obviously, the dislocation part is going to be huge, uh, especially if you're looking at millimeter wave spectrum bands to be used for a lot of this. You really got to have the sites available to really support what's happening out there. So uh, that's going to be a big, a big, big part of kind of this movement towards IoT is really going to be what 5G can bring to the table, it seems. Yeah, and, and the reduced latency. So, you know, we yeah. talked about the ability to move a bunch of data, but it's also the latency, you know, reducing that so that, you know, people are actually having what we think is a, a, a wireless fiber experience. So, you know, the same way if you have fiber in your home or you're a Fios customer, you know, where you, the way you may be consumed content in your house, you know, we want to make sure you're having that same experience across the 5G network in a wireless environment. So, we look at it as your wireless fiber. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Definitely, it's kind of definitely uh, requiring a, a rethink of how networks are deployed and uh, the technology. So it's, uh, again, for us covering the space, it's very interesting to watch how it's all happening. And uh, it does seem like it's happening at a pretty rapid pace. But like you said, it's been a, an ongoing process for dozens and dozens of years, really, kind of evolution like what's happening out there. But uh, a lot happening in the space today, that's, that's for sure. It is, you know, like, like I said, when we're talking about the standards, you know, we've deployed in 10 markets. Yep. So we've got 10 test markets and pretty geographically dispersed. So, you know, we've got some in the Northeast, Southwest, up in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, you know, of course, we've got about, you know, three right here, you know, by our headquarter offices in New Jersey. Yep. And, and, you know, everyone's involved. You know, we're seeing really good throughput. We're seeing really reduced uh, latency. And yeah, I think it, it, it really is about having, you know, talented engineers, you know, in the telecommunications space who are really able to simulate loads and it really make sense of all this. So it's actually kind of amazing to me, you know, how uh, our network engineers are able to go out and sort of do this and, you know, just sort of build it and, you know, take advantage of the ecosystem and share the information and get feedback. So it's impressive to watch. Yeah, no, definitely. And I know from the, from the outside looking in, just just imagining what those guys have to do in terms of these deployments, uh, it's it's crazy. I mean, I know I've been covering the space for quite some time, and just looking at the evolution of technology, this seems like such a, a significant jump in what's happened uh, before that it's just going to be amazing to watch all happen again. I know for, for the engineers there, it's it's a lot of work, but uh, you know, it's, it's really kind of making making a big difference in the world as well. So it's kind of interesting yeah. how, how it all plays out. Yeah, you know, that, that's interesting too. You said you know making a difference in the world, and you know. Um, a lot of times I get involved with uh, panels or you know, other conferences and the debates will always be around things like, you know, well, education, you know, we have to solve the education problem. How do we deliver content? And, you know, what about things like data privacy and security? And, you know, the, the way I think about it is exactly the way you framed it up. You know, when you talk about education and you talk about public safety and you talk about like the autonomous vehicle, where the autonomous vehicle, really the whole concept of this is to reduce fatalities. Yeah. And you know, there's going to be issues like, you know, we have to solve for privacy, we have to solve for security, we've got to solve for a lot of the uh, people type issues, but these are definitely problems worth solving. I mean, when you start talking about, you know, your children's education and you start talking about, you know, uh, uh, safety on major transportation corridors yeah. and the initiative to bring fatalities down to zero or, you know, ensuring that our big cities, you know, Seattle, New York, Boston, LA, continue to have economic growth, but also our cities that we want to live in at the same time, you know, those are problems we're solving. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, hey, Mark, we definitely appreciate the great insight today, obviously. Uh, I think we could talk about this topic for about another two hours if we if we had time, but uh, I'll save our viewers and save you as well from having to do that. But uh, definitely appreciate the great insight today. Thanks so much for the time, and uh, hopefully we can touch base again soon and dig into some more of the, of the IoT space, but thanks so much for the time. Thank you. Well, thanks for watching this week's show, and make sure to check out our next episode when we speak with 556 Ventures to dissect third quarter career results. Thanks for watching.